Good morning. morning. Happy Easter. Easter. He is risen. risen. (laughs) Some of you have been to church before. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder if there's anyone else here like me. I hope not. But (laughs) anyway who has their favorite restaurants. Do you have maybe one or two restaurants that you really like to go to? And if so, do you have a favorite menu item? Can you imagine that menu item? You get excited about it, right? You can't eat there all the time, but when you do, it's awesome. You think about it when you're driving there on the way. Now, maybe this has happened to you. You've gotten to said restaurant. You decided to eat there on a holiday, like today. And you're handed something you didn't like, the prefix menu. And so in a panic, you look at the menu and try to find the favorite food, and it's not there. Have you ever had that happen to you? No? I guess it's just me. (laughs) I don't like the prefix menu. This happened to me many years ago. There are other things about holidays I don't like about restaurants, but many years ago, it was Valentine's Day. My wife and I decided to go to our favorite restaurant, and we were handed a prefix menu. I didn't like that because, you see, I'm like a meat and potatoes kind of guy. I go straight for the main course. That's me. If I'm adventurous, I'll get an appetizer once in a while, but I just want to eat. So I don't bother with the salad, and I don't eat dessert. I know that he's crazy. So I end up on the prefix paying for all these things I didn't want. It's a set price. So here's what we did. We decided that we would celebrate Valentine's Day 364 days a year. And on Valentine's Day, we would stay home and just have the airing of the grievances. That's it. If you caught that reference, good for you. Now, what a lot of people don't know, I'm going to let you in on some secrets on the back end of church. A lot of people don't know that churches do this too. Churches have a prefix menu, so to speak, that they serve on holidays. It's what normally happens on Christmas and Easter. Now, Deputy Johnson, I don't think he's here today, as he couldn't make it. And so first of all, Deputy Johnson, he helps out at the church, great volunteer. And he's not here today. I just want to say a moment of thanks. He'll probably watch it later. Thank you for what you do. But he told you last week, does the announcements, follows up for me. He told you last week that he was a pastor at a mega church. that is a really big church then decided to become a cop. And that tells you everything you need to know about this job. (laughs) In fact, I started to think about, I'm like, why would you do that, Tony? Like, what's wrong with you? And I've said that to him, you're crazy. But then after a few counseling sessions, I started thinking, I would love to arrest this person and put them in jail. So I get it now. It's absolutely fantastic. But he told you last week, if you were paying attention, that when you work in ministry after a while, you start to hate Christmas and Easter. No one's going to tell you this. But during Christmas and Easter time, if you work in ministry, they put on a big production. So it's when you drive your staff crazy. They're all running around trying to do all this different stuff. You got to order the bouncy castles, right? We got to have, someone's got to pack the Easter eggs. And so it just makes you crazy. And some churches do like 13,000 services all weekend long. It's nuts. And this is what the church does when it's trying to be big, when it's trying to be a mega church. But here's what happens. The production value goes up, but the biblical value goes down. And so I'll tell you a pastoral secret. And if you've been in church for a long time, you've heard it. You know that the pastor on Easter and Christmas usually doesn't use a lot of scriptures. We don't want to do that to people, inundate them with something they don't understand. Also, I bet you noticed, the message gets a little shorter 
It's like 25, 20 minutes. You don't want to push anybody too much or step on any toes. Tony told you why this doesn't work. Well, first of all, he noted that you spend thousands of dollars on these services, but barely anybody comes back the next week. It's insanity. But they keep doing it over and over and over again, expecting a different result. And I'll tell you why people, even if they do come back the next week, won't come back the week after that. Because they look around and they go, where's the bouncy castle? How come the pastor's still preaching? <laughs> it's 20 minutes already. Shut up. <laughs> I have to get lunch. Why are there so many scriptures on the screen? He's talking about all these things I don't understand. They won't come back the next week because we've presented a bait and switch. That's what the church does. So I want to state a couple things. It's going to be interesting. At C3, and you probably guessed this if you came in here, we're not trying to be a megachurch. That's not our objective. It's our objective to love our community, to be a family. That's it. Just be a family of Christians together. When the room fills up, people, what are we going to do? I don't know. I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but we'll be okay. There are 13,000 churches in Naples, Florida. <laughs> we don't need another one, right? That's it. We're done. So we're not trying to do that here. We're trying to be a church. I want to know all your names. I want to do life with you. I want this to be a family. And that's what the leadership here wants. So you're going to Here's some cool things about the cafe. We're now opening that up Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. It's about loving people, the proceeds from the really awesome coffee. If you had some of that, it's fantastic. It's going to go toward helping our community. So we need volunteers. They're going to they're ask for that probably in the announcements. But. So today, here's the deal. It's going to be a little different, but you'll make it. We'll feed you afterwards, too. It's a prefix menu, but you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so, you know, can't get everything perfect all the time. But today, if you are a regular attender, you're going to get excited about this. You should be anyway. You're not going to get the prefix menu. Amen? You're going to get scriptures today. It's going to be exciting. I'll show you some things you might not have seen before in your Bibles. And if you're new here today, welcome. You are our honored guests. Therefore, I'm going to give you the full course. We're going to give you the full menu today, not last year's leftovers. So again, happy Easter at C3. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. We celebrate that all the time. We sing those songs all the time. And every day in the life of a practicing Christian is the Lord's Day. Every day. I want to welcome you into that today. So it's all about the resurrection. We're continuing, continually celebrating that. It's on my mind a lot. Today, you notice the video. We're going to continue in our series, The Rest of the Story. So we are a church that loves in word and deed. We love our community. We love our people. We're a people church, not a program church. We honor the Word of God, though. That's the thing, and we've seen this. A lot of churches really aren't honoring the Word of God, meaning you could go to church for like 10 years here in America and probably not ever hear or read the whole Bible. That's a shame. And there are a lot of programs that I've talked about, like The Story. Leaves people thinking that they've read the whole Bible. And we've learned here, they didn't. A lot of lifelong Christians have come to church and said to me, I had no idea that was in the Bible. And so what's really good is that we're covering it. What's really bad is it's not being taught. You can't say that this is God's word, but, well, this part here is not important. <laughs> what? It's either all God's word or not. And so it's all important. It's not up to people to pick and choose like that. So we're going to continue in the rest of the story. You can go back online and watch some of the messages. Last week we talked about King Amaziah. So if you don't know anything about this stuff, I'll try to make it easy. King David, 
David and Goliath, you probably know who he is, right? You probably know who his son Solomon is. Wealthy guy, right? So several generations after that, there's King Amaziah. And we're learning lessons from these kings and their prophets weaving throughout the story. So Amaziah was known for his arrogance. So we talked about arrogance. That was the application last week. Then I kind of skipped over some stuff in the second part of the chapter, and that might have surprised my fact checkers there. <laughs> why did he do that? This week, you're going to find out exactly why. We're going to pick up in 2 Kings, where I kind of skipped over. 2 Kings 14, 25. Jeroboam II recovered the territories of Israel between Labohemoth and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah. Interesting. Son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So today, we're going to talk about Jonah. Now, you might say, what does that have? He's ruining Easter. <laughs> this guy, he's just ruining Easter. I love ruining things, right? So no bouncy castle, no Easter egg, no candy, and now we're going to learn about Jonah. He's going to talk about a whale. Like, where am I right now? Listen, hang in there. Okay, so the people encourage, if you're not new, if you come a lot, like, just, just hold the person's hand next to you and say, it's okay, He's, he always does this. He get, gets a little confusing, and then he, it'll, it, it'll just calm down, right? We have food afterwards, it's gonna, you're going to live. So here's the thing. Jonah, short four-chapter novella, so to speak, between Obadiah and Micah, if you're still looking for it in your Bibles, I think you got it, good. So a lot of people think of Jonah, and they think of the whale, and that Jonah, he was in the belly of a whale because he was disobedient. That's usually where people go, but there's a little bit more to the story than that. So I'm going to shorten it a tiny bit, but fill you in with some of the really important details. Yes, it's all really important, but anyway. So you have this guy, Jonah, and he flees from the Lord after being told to prophesy to the people in Nineveh, that is an Assyrian city. So the point here is that, and this story is really told by the Jewish people because they don't like the Assyrians. So the kingdom of Israel fell to them, and so eh, they don't like them. It's a little bit before that if we're placing Jonah here. So it's to teach the people there. The moral is to teach the people, be nice <laughs> to the other nations. That's it. Jonah doesn't want to be nice. Go and prophesy destruction against them. Instead, Jonah decides to go to Joppa. And Dorcas or Tabitha isn't there yet. That's many years later. You got to be deep to get that one. He goes to Joppa and he boards, he boards a ship to go to Tarshish. He pays a fare, boards the ship. But the Lord sends a great wind against the sea and this causes a storm. The boat is going to break up. And so the sailors on the boat, they freak out, they cry out to their gods, they start throwing cargo overboard, lightening the ship, I guess, I've never been in this situation, is supposed to help out when you're about to have a shipwreck. Don't know. But anyway, they're doing this, but Jonah, he's in like the cargo hold, sleeping. Now, if you read the ancient Greek version, it says snoring. He's snoring, so maybe the captain hears it, so the captain comes down. What are you doing? Wake up. Get up, pray to your God. Maybe he'll save us. In the meantime, the sailors are casting lots. So this is kind of like rolling dice. But the lots point to Jonah as the culprit. So they approach him. Why has a storm come upon us? And they start grilling him. Who are you? Where do you come from? What's your nationality? Well, he says, I'm a Hebrew. Doesn't answer all the questions. I worship the God of the heavens. He created the land and the sea here. They start freaking out because previously, it says, he had told them that he was fleeing from his God. Uh-oh. <laughs> what did you do? And so they ask him, what do we need to do to you to make this stop? Well, throw me overboard. Throw me in the sea. Well, the text just says that they just keep rowing. They're like, no, nope, we're going to sort this out, but it doesn't work out. The storm keeps getting worse and worse and worse, so they go back to him, and now they cry out to the Lord, not their false gods. 
Don't hold us responsible for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. We know that you had a good reason for putting the storm against us. <laughs> Pick him up, throw him out of the boat. But the Lord sent, well, sea monsters better, big fish, to swallow up Jonah, and he's in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights. Turn the page. <laughs> so now we get something like a psalm, chapter 2. Something like a psalm. Jonah is crying out to God, and it says, from the belly of the fish. So it kind of zooms in and out here. It can be a little bit confusing. I called out, Lord, and you answered me. I called out, and you heard me in this distress. And he describes sinking down to the sea. There's seaweed wrapped around his head, but still I'll face your temple. I'll cry out to you. I praise you, Lord. And that's what he's doing there. Those who worship idols, they're evil. I don't do that. I worship you and trust in you alone from the belly of the fish. And then it says that the whale or the fish vomits Jonah out, spits him on the beach or the dry land, depending on your translation. Turn the page. So chapter 3, the Lord says, Jonah, rise up, get up. Go to Nineveh, pronounce this judgment against them. So he goes this time. Now he's finally obedient. Took a lot, didn't it? <laughs> he's finally obedient. He gets to Nineveh. It's a city so large that it takes three days to walk around it or see it all, depending on your translation. But when he gets there, he's obedient. He proclaims judgment against Nineveh. In 40 days, this city will be destroyed. The people respond. They put on sackcloth and they fast. Now, sackcloth is like, imagine the worst wool sweater you've ever worn in your life. And the idea here is if you don't want to be happy, let's say you're mourning for someone or you're supposed to be repenting of something, you put this on and it ensures that you're not going to be happy. That's the point. And so sometimes people do it for show. Sometimes it's under like a king's garment. Sometimes they, they do it for different reasons. So anyway, they put this on. The king himself hears about it. He gets off his throne, takes off his royal robes, puts the sackcloth on himself, and sits on a heap of ashes. Then they send out a decree, him and his noblemen. Everybody's to do this. You're to fast. You are to pray. Perhaps God will relent. Are you going to give up your murders, your violence, it says, evil ways? And sure enough, it works. God changes his mind here. He doesn't do it. But Jonah gets very angry. He doesn't like this. <laughs> Jonah says, and this is kind of interesting, I forgot something funny. You know who else wears the sackcloth? The animals. Even the animals fast. It says, you nor the animals can eat anything. It's just kind of a funny thought. Right? Why would you put a sackcloth on an animal? Some of you do this. Think about it. Maybe your cat or your dog was the Easter bunny this year. Huh? See? You're weird too. That's why your animals are secretly plotting to kill you in your sleep. <laughs> anyway, almost forgot that part. It's kind of a funny thing. How could I forget a funny part? Anyway, Jonah, Jonah kind of makes an excuse here. So now we're in chapter 4. Jonah makes an excuse here. He's like, that's why I didn't go the first time. I knew you were a merciful God filled with loving kindness, right? So I knew you were going to do that. That's why I didn't listen to you. I was going to save you some trouble here. Uh-huh. I'm so angry. He's like, just kill me if what I said won't come true. Pretty prideful guy. Interesting. Should you really be angry about this? So now he goes to the east side of the city, builds himself like a tent, a shelter, because he still thinks maybe it's going to happen. He wants to see them die. So God causes a big leafy plant to grow over Jonah's head, and it brings him comfort, it says. Kind of funny because he already has a tent anyway. There's a plant. causes him comfort. He loves it. But then, <laughs> dawn the next day causes a worm to come and eat like the root of the plant, killing it. 
And now God sends a scorching wind against me. So hot, he feels like he's going to pass out and die. That's what he says. I want to die, basically. So God says, why should you be angry about this? He does it again, second round of this. <laughs> should you be angry about the plant? Yes, so angry, I want to die. Kind of blowing things out of proportion, don't you think? So the Lord says... You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly. It died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, Greek says, who don't know their right from their left. Not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And it ends right there. Now, some will say that this is not a real story because who can get swallowed up by a big fish or sea monster and live in there for three days? That's not possible. So they fictionalize it. It's literally a big fish story. Some scholars will even say that it's a fictional story. What they point to is little funny ironies or literary devices and things. They take it up a notch a little bit with their intellectualism. Fair enough. Maybe it is. Or maybe it's been constructed a certain way to be based on a true story. Certainly, we saw that Jonah was a real prophet. Second Kings is a historical book. So if he's in there, it's real, and it really happened. I want to show you something kind of interesting. The news story. <laughs> it actually happened. Now, I snoped it. <laughs> you can't trust everything you read on the Internet, and we all know that, right? <laughs> but I saw a bunch of big fish stories, <laughs> and so I had to, like, vet them very carefully. And I vetted this one. It's actually true. So meet the guy. There he is. <laughs> Medically documented. Witnesses and everything. He got swallowed by a whale. Didn't stay in there for three days. Probably didn't pray a psalm. But still, doesn't negate this guy's experience. Pray for him. <laughs> Apparently, it's possible to get swallowed by a whale. Who knew? Well, the Bible told us. <laughs> Here's the other thing, and I've gone this way and that way in my walk with the Lord on this, but I finally come to this conclusion. God is able. Anything is possible with God. We should never discount his miracles just because we didn't see it. Never. God is able. It's about Faith. That's what we celebrate today. So if this could happen, Jesus could raise from the dead. If we go and discount something like this, well, then it makes it easy for people to discount Jesus. And we need to be careful with that. Now, some of you in the room probably knew where I was going. Some didn't. Maybe you know that Jesus mentions Jonah in Matthew and Luke, two of the Gospels. So let's go to Matthew. Matthew 12, 38. One day, some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand such a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Like Jonah, some people will fictionalize Jesus. But to Jesus, this wasn't fiction, was it? 
So I'm going to take a moment and do something that I do do every year, usually around Easter, because it's kind of important. One of the things, it's just kind of a base part of our Christianity that people ignore, is that we're supposed to be telling people about Jesus. And then they're going to hit us with stuff, like all this made-up stuff that maybe they learn in college. And we have to be able to make a defense for why we believe. The Bible tells us that, all of us, not just like, oh, that, talk to my pastor. No, all of us. It's kind of silly, right? We believe so many things. We're so willing to talk about so many things, put them on the internet, all this stuff. We can make a defense for why we like our favorite sports team. We can make a defense for why we're red or blue politically. We can, make a def we can defend just about anything. So we know about taking the time to learn about things, but with our eternal salvation, very few Christians can make a really good defense. That's a problem. So I'm going to help you out a little bit with something. How do we know? How do we know that this is real? Now, Christians always do. It's about relationship, man. That means nothing to someone who doesn't believe. They just think you're crazy. It's about really, what, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Oh, go ask my pastor. Not convincing, right? If you don't believe, don't you go to church and read your Bible? How come you don't know? Weird. So here's the thing. Basic charge leveled against the Bible. I'm sure you've all heard this one. The Bible, let's talk about the New Testament, not the Old Testament. It gets dicey in there. It's complicated. So let's just talk about the New Testament right now, the things written about Jesus. Yes, I know, not the prophecies. I get it. But the New Testament, what people will say is it's like a long game of telephone, been played over hundreds of years. Have you heard that? Like, it just, they just, Told the story over and over again. So many things have changed. It's not reliable. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's the first thing you got to shoot down. It's real easy. And I used my Alexander the Great example. It's my favorite one because it's simple. Do you believe in Alexander the Great? Yes. Why? Because of the things written about him. That's why you believe in that. Okie dokie. Fine. Let's look at those things. And you can look it up, but I'm going to make this short today because I went with Jonah, decided to do that instead. <laughs> The things written that we have today for Alexander the Great come three and four hundred years after his death. Thinking about that, right? So that's it. The things we have written about, we don't have anything else before that. We don't own it. It's dust. We only have that. That's how we know about Alexander the Great. Writings three and four hundred years after his death. Wait, that sounds like the charge leveled against the Bible, doesn't it? Yeah. Yet, but do you believe in him? Yeah. Why? Because of the historical writings. My professor told me. Huh. Well, let's look at the New Testament. 27 witnesses. 27 books. It's not just one book. 27 witnesses to Jesus. Written by witnesses. <laughs> Matthew. He's an apostle. He had an interaction with Jesus. He's a witness. And if they're not witnesses... They interviewed, Luke, people who were witnesses. He hung out with the Apostle Paul a lot, a whole bunch of other people, and he interviewed them to get his information right. All of the books of the New, of the New Testament were all written in a witness period. All of them, not three or 400 years later. Now, there's a favorite among scholars, and I'll tell you about it. You have probably, if you've never even picked up a Bible, you've heard some of these verses. First Corinthians, you went to a wedding, <laughs> and you heard 1 Corinthians 13. But if you kept reading, or they just started flying off the handle and reading scriptures at this wedding, you'd get to 1 Corinthians 15. It is super important in making a defense. First of all, scholars, whether they believe in Jesus or not, will all say that that's a historical document. Is written by a guy named Paul who was really important in the church. He believed what he was writing. The people he was writing to clearly believed him. And it was written about 25 years after what we celebrate today. That's a lot better than three or 400. Now, you got to change your thinking, right? We're spoiled. We get it immediately, immediately. I can't find, my phone takes more than like one, two. I'm like, come on! You know, like, it's that bad. You know, I just, I'm done. I turn it off, right? So 25 years, calm down to get your Google result. But anyway, <laughs> dial up. It's worse than dial up. 
this is not normal in ancient history. In fact, there's nothing else like it. Nothing. Everything else is coming hundreds of years later. That was the norm. This is super fast. This happened. Jesus rose from the dead. What? I can't believe this. Let's write it down and tell everybody. They're scrambling for copies of this letter. What did Paul say? They're literally dying to deliver it and get it. Dying. Think about that. Our convenience. <laughs> they're dying to get their hands on this. Dying. And this is what they're doing. They're grabbing the letter and saying, hold on a second. They're washing off papyrus, <laughs> other stuff, love notes. I don't care. Whatever this is. Hold on. I got, I got some papyrus. I want to copy this down here. And it's circulating like mad. It's getting out there like crazy because this really happened. This is crazy. we got to tell everybody about this. Amazing. So here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. This is Paul, the apostle, writing. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. He was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. This is historical gold. It's, there's nothing like it in ancient history. This is a witness writing about real events that happened, calling others into account, famous people. You're not going to mention famous people if you're lying. You can check. And then, oh, the other 500 people. Check with some of them. Most of them are alive. Any historian will tell you there's nothing like this for this time period. It's historical gold. So that's what you have in your hand right there. It's the Word of God, but it's also a history book. Now, there are many similarities between the story of Jonah and the story of Jesus. So Jesus calls his death the sign of Jonah because it points to Jesus' death and his burial, three days as Jonah was in the sea monster or fish for three days. Jonah's release from the sea monster fish prefigures Jesus' resurrection. Jesus and Jonah both rose up after being entombed for three days. Both came with a message from God. In both cases, they were awakened while sleeping in a boat. Look at the end of Mark 4. And this awakening in both cases resulted in the calming of a sea. In both cases, some of those participating in the sacrifice came to believe. See Mark 15, the Roman soldier. Jonah's casting into the water, repenting and rising again, gives us a picture of baptism which is a representation of Jesus' death and resurrection. When we get baptized, we die to ourselves. And we come up out of the water, rising, a new creation in Christ. This is why in the early church, and still, some like the Orthodox Church practice this, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, on Saturday, they call it Holy Saturday, they read Jonah. It's been a practice in the early church for a long time. Jonah's name means dove. This also has foreshadowing. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. Jesus told his apostles, be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. And this is how we should be as we spread his good, not bad, 
good news. Now, if you know the story, and I won't tell this one too, because you guys are going to get hungry and cranky. You know the story of Noah. He sent out a dove, raven, I know. Also dove to find new life. And this is a picture of how we are to be as we proclaim new life in Christ. It all comes together, I told you. But here's the difference, big difference, between Jonah and Jesus. Jonah was disobedient at first. Jesus was always, always obedient. So one section of Scripture I encourage some of you to look at on Friday, Philippians 2. Beautiful. My favorite verses of Scripture that describe what Jesus did in his obedience. And it says, Philippians 2, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be taken advantage of. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself in obedience to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For that reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above all names. So that every knee will bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone in heaven, on earth, below the earth, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Important. So as Christians, we are called to be like Jesus. Make your own attitude, that of Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and was obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. As Christians, we are called to live in obedience to Christ, period. We're called into commitment. We've seen in this series that commitment is key. We've also seen It really seems that the world today lacks commitment. No one wants to commit to anything, do they? It's kind of a problem. So if you're not new here, keep coming back. But if you are new here today, if you just came for a visit, you're like, where's the bouncy castle? (laughs) I rebuke you for that. (laughs) I encourage you to come back. Come back. If you're from out of town, find a Bible-believing church and commit to it. Join it. Keep coming back. And I want you to know something. It's a family, and so it's going to have its issues. If you're looking for the perfect church, good luck. You're not going to find it. It's not supposed to be like that. Also, I encourage you, find a small family-based church where you can't hide. Church is about not just commitment, but accountability. You're supposed to do life with one another. We were never meant to be alone. You shouldn't be alone. And know that if you're here at C3, you're not alone. You're not alone. We're here for you. But don't look for all the big stuff shiny, glossy, you hear about all these controversies in these big churches. If a church is bragging about the numbers, trying to be big, it's a real red flag. And there's going to be big problems behind the scenes because they're running it like a business and not a church. It was never supposed to be like that. So look for a place that you can commit to and you can get into the practice of commitment in Christianity, consistency in community, And that's okay. I don't want to shame anybody if you just usually come on Christmas and Easter. That's fine. But just think of one thing. If you just went to the gym two times a year, if you only worked out two times a year, do you think it would work out for you? Neither does Christianity. There's a purpose in the church and the reason the Bible talks about it. It's important. 
So perhaps consider coming to church and committing to Christ as he is committed to you. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone, in the sound of my voice, everyone tuning online. I thank you so much for that ministry. Every person who came in here, visitor, if it's the first time, Lord, open their hearts so that you can receive, they can receive your spirit. Fill them with your love, your kindness, your mercy as they go out this week as vehicles of your love and obedience to you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.